given the wide variety of tools that have been built up over the years for starting to mitigate errors in quantum systems, you know, starting with things like robust pulse sequences, um, moving on through things like decoupling and decoherence free subspaces, the self correction, different things like this, onto error correction and fault tolerance. Um, you know, what do you think the path forward looks like? I, will it be that we go straight to, you know, that we're looking at building a full tolerant quantum computer doing error correction codes on top of essentially raw physical operations? Or are we likely to see some combination of these effects or some, you know, some different focuses through time? Um, just how, how do you view these things as progressing? I always have a weird view on this, which is that I think we will always be doing the thing we, we can do that's the hardest we can possibly do at the given time to get the most bang out of it, right? So, so in my mind, there's sort of, there is this sort of what I call, I always call it the brute force approach, which is, you know, really like we are, our hardware is right on the cusp of being able to do these, these, these computations. Let's see how much we can get out of that. And, and, and this really does, for most uh, systems that are laid out on a 2D spatial grid, right, lead you to the surface code. That's like clearly a code that has a lot of really awesome properties. Um, uh, and then you sort of, you know, you sort of think, well, what could happen to change that? Well, one thing that could happen to change that is, you know, things like thinking about the connectivity of the architecture, right? And so, you know, we do know in, in trapped ions, uh, I worked for uh, the startup IonQ for, for a little bit, right? Uh, within the trap, they have all all connectivity and you try to try to ask the question, can you leverage that to perform error correction using different codes, right? And in fact, we've seen that. We've seen a demonstration of some error correcting protocols, right, in trapped ions that are made possibly easier because of this all tall connectivity, any qubit can talk to anything else. Um, but it, you kind of think about it is they're doing the best they can possibly do within that physical system, right? Um, but I also think the other thing is what was mentioned, which is like finding physical systems that embody error correction. The most famous example of this is Microsoft's effort in topological quantum computing, trying to use Majorana fermions to do quantum computation. And then you, you, do, you have this physical substrate that because of the physics of the device is protected. Um, but I, like John, believe actually we're, we're maybe even just at the beginning of exploring what we can do with hardware that looks like maybe the Majorana fermions, but maybe it's not exactly that. So applying air correction to the engineering of small, medium-sized um, uh, uh, systems to do air correction. And this is, a, this is the thing I love because it's sort of this middle way. The topological one is sort of engineer a condensed matter system that has these exotic properties. And it's very hard because condensed matter things are messy and dirty. And then we have this other efforts, which is we've gotten really good at actually sort of engineering and building interesting um, you know, quantum, quantum systems where we have pretty exquisite control. And the question is, can we marry these things to come up with something in that, that middle path? And I actually, if I have to predict, that's what I'll bet on these days. But um, as, as John likes to remind me, I once did say that the only way to build a quantum computer is topological. But, <laughs> and he's going to hold up me to that, I think, for the rest and of my life. And you went to Google and not Microsoft. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, so so Sorry. The, 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 sorry, there is a joke at Microsoft, I think, in Copenhagen. Uh, basically, will they find the you know topological qubits first or uh, Mayorana himself? <laughs> because he went missing. Because <laughs> Mayorana would famously went missing. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, given that we have all of these different um, fault tolerance schemes that have been worked out, different error correction codes, different approaches, different techniques for mitigating error. Um, and we've started to see experimental demonstrations of error correction and of full tolerant gate sets and different things like this. Um, you know, what are the barriers that still exist to building full tolerant quantum computers? You know, what, I mean, Dave, you're at Google, which has obviously been one of the leading uh, experimental efforts on superconducting qubits. Um, I'm not asking you to speak uh, for experimentalists, but you know, what do you see as the, the main barriers ahead of us? I mean, John said it in some fun of it away, it's still extremely hard to get these experiments to, there's still experiments, right, to get them to work. Um, you know, it, you know, we are just learning how to do this. I think there are some things that we're starting to see that are interesting, which is 
you know, there's a word in quantum computing that I, I don't like to say it because I don't really know what it means, which is scalable, right? And people say, talk about scalable technologies and scalable feels like one of these things to me that like you see it after you've sort of, you know, you know it when you see it, right? Like it, it, it's kind of hard to describe because it has a lot of components. Um, but we definitely see that a lot of quantum computing for many years was focused inwardly on improving parts of a system, right? Getting better, uh, you know, base decoherence rates, working on controlling single qubits, you know, working on particular parts, getting measurement to work with, you know, without reading the wrong bit out, right? So it was always sort of focused on components. And then, you know, what we've seen in the last few years is the bringing together of these things at the same time and coordinating them. And of course, when you do that, nothing nothing survives that, <laughs> you know, nothing survives put, being put together and mashed together to work correctly at the same time. And so I think that's that's one key challenge we're seeing for, especially for sort of these, you know, brute force type approaches is, is getting that to work at everything at the same time. Or, you know, I think that's, that's one of the key things we're seeing um, as a challenge. And then the other thing is just the technology to scale this up is, is extremely challenging, right? Like, so wiring, right? Like you see these pictures of like Google's uh, the cry inside of the cryostat and you realize these are all wires going down to this chip right like that obviously doesn't scale right again it's one of these things we can't really you can't you can't tell me exactly but you can say that doesn't really scale so i think it's it's trying to figure out how to scale while keeping all the principles of getting these these qubit rates uh degenerate rates and you know low um and the final thing to say is just like, if we can find ways to do them all at the same time and be significantly better, we should be doing that. And that will lessen our overhead and the scaling becomes less of a challenge. So it's not straightforward which of these you should actually focus on, right? Like, should you focus on scaling things up? Maybe, maybe you should also focus on, you know, uh, you know, 10 to the minus five error rate at, for your two qubit gates. That would be incredible, right? That would, that would change the dynamics of how much scaling you need to do. So it's not clear how to play those trade-offs right now. Um, at least well, look, what would we like to see? We, we would like to see that as you increase the size of a quantum error correcting code block, say in the surface code, the error rates decline exponentially with the size of that code block. That's kind of the hallmark of quantum error correction. And we would also like to see that gates can be protected with that exponential improvement in fidelity as we scale things up. We haven't seen that yet. Why haven't we? Well, the short answer is the gates aren't good enough. The error rates are too high. Now, actually, there was a very interesting experiment that the Google group did where they did see exponential improvement in the error rate as they increased the size of the code block. But the catch was uh, it wasn't a full-blown quantum error correcting code. They can only correct one type of error, the dephasing errors, not the bit flips in that uh, configuration. Still, it was a very interesting experiment because they were able to do up to 50 repeated rounds of quantum error correction. That's another thing we'd like to see. We'd like to see many successive rounds. And they were able to say that as they increase the size of the code block, from three to seven to 11, uh, you know, each time the error rate went down by an order of magnitude, which was, you know, what the theory predicted should happen. Like, like I said, the catch was they couldn't correct all the errors. And then we've seen some other experiments recently, like one done by Honeywell, where uh, they were able to do repeated rounds of error correction for a real full-blown quantum error correcting code that can correct any one arbitrary error in um, a block of seven, but they did not succeed in getting an error rate which was improved by using quantum error correction compared to the you know unprotected error rates. And uh, so of course Dave was right. We need to it's a it's a war with many fronts. There are a lot of things we have to improve. Uh, but the most important one in my view, is the physical error rates have to go down. So that's right. And the, there are interesting trade-offs there too, even, right? So, I mean, the, the, in the same paper that John described were the Google results, they did a, tried to do an analysis of like, what are the main contributing errors? And it's true that, for example, two cubic gates are important. But one of the other biggest problems is, you know, in those systems, you have long measurement times. If you have long measurement times, 
your other qubits are idling. And if they're idling, they're decohering, right? So you need to do things like dynamic decoupling, other techniques to preserve this while this is occurring. So it, so it, there's a bunch of different things that are playing off each other here. And it, some things like, you know, the, the art of like understanding that landscape is, is a challenging one. And we are seeing more and more people trying to like work in that space and understand it. Of course, you know, like John and his team have been doing this for a long time, but it's sort of like there's a new burgeoning field where people are starting to really think about all these trade-offs and, and understand that landscape, or at least maybe get some idea about like where you need to be focusing your improvements. <laughs> you know, it's not just the time to do the measurement, which is an issue. You also have to reset the yeah. qubits after the measurement. And that's actually where a lot of the time budget went. That's and right, measurement and reset. reset. Yeah, that's right. Measurement and reset. You sort of have a, a general thing of getting it back to where it was, right? So this is a bit of an aside, but I think it's worth mentioning. In that Google experiment, each round of error correction took about a microsecond. And in the Honeywell work, each round of error correction took 200 milliseconds. Okay, so it's a many order of magnitude difference in the cycle time. And maybe that's not a big deal in the short term. But eventually, it's going to be a big deal because uh, if you can get the time to solution to be shorter by a factor of ten to the five, that's that's a big win. So I think it's this is going to be a big challenge for ion traps going forward. They want much faster gates, and potentially there are ways of doing that, you know, with more laser power and so on. But that's a, that's a big technical challenge in itself. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the interesting things um, about this Google experiment, as you mentioned, only correcting one type of um, one type of error. Um, one of the more, you know, one of the works that stood out to me, I visited um, QEC in 2007, uh, so a long time ago, and I, I believe you and Panosiliferous had a paper at that about, um, about biased noise. Uh, correcting against bias noise and getting a, a much better threshold than you might otherwise uh, get. And it seems, you know, some of the recent work, you know, in the last year or two that has captured people's uh, imagination a bit has been, for example, these uh, XEZX code and things like this, which is basically the surface code, but you're just writing stabilizers in a slightly better way. Well, in a slightly more suitable way to deal with bias noise. Um, and so, I, I mean, I guess a question I have is, is it not natural that we would start to correct one type of error, the dominant kind of error first? In the same way that, for example, if you're, you know, trying to build a better trapped ion or something like that, you try to knock off the, um, the sources of error one at a time, starting with the most, uh, you know, whatever your dominant source of error is. It's a natural idea, but it's tricky to implement. Uh, so thank you for remembering that 2007 paper uh, with Ala Ferris. And what we were very troubled by at the time was we wanted to consider a noise model, which was highly biased. Uh, so in the jargon, we use, uh, you know, Z errors uh, had a high error rate and X errors had a low error rate. So essentially, uh, there, are two, there are two main types of errors and uh, one was uh, much worse than the other. And so we wanted to focus our error correcting power on these more frequent uh, Z errors, but we also wanted to do processing. We wanted to do a quantum computation. And when you start doing the gates, you have to worry about how the logic uh, affects the noise. And so we, we figured out how to build little gadgets uh, that could take advantage of um, the bias and still enable us to do a universal quantum computation. And the, th the thing that, uh, came as a surprise to me, which was first pointed out a couple of years ago, is that in uh, the setting of a certain kind of qubit, you can realize in particular using a superconducting technology, it's possible to do operations that flip the bits while preserving the bias. We had to find some other more complicated workaround. And uh, so that has, uh, you know, generated some uh, optimism about taking advantage of the bias and the noise. And uh, well, I can say a little bit more about that, but maybe 
uh, maybe we can save that for later, but uh, it requires a particular type of way of encoding the qubits uh, to get that to work. 